Good evening. Uh, we'll post uh, another Sunday school lesson, Romans chapter 2. I'm getting this done a little bit early in the week. This is unusual for me. Uh, i got a busy week ahead of me, though, but and uh, I'm uh, fortunate to get, get to do it tonight. Um, before we get into this, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you tonight. We uh, thank you for your word to guide and direct us. Lord, we pray for your spirit to, to guide us in the study of your word, help us to rightly divide your word. Lord, we pray for all those that may be unsaved that, that uh, hear this. Lord, we pray for your spirit to draw them, your mercy be upon them. Uh, Lord, we pray for each and every one of us that are, are born-again believers. We pray for your word to uh, sink into our heart, Lord, and we be do your doers of your word, not just hearers, and help us to, to be the witness we need to be as we go out and live out our everyday lives. Lord, again, we lift you up as our friend and Savior, our King of kings, our Lord Lords. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Only your will be done, Lord. Amen. Um, in this chapter, um, Paul, he sort of calls out the Jews uh, for some of the error in, the, in their ways. And uh, as, uh, you know, uh, Paul is wanting to go to Rome, and he's writing this letter to them, and probably from Corinth. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And as we know, um, uh, preachers or even us in our everyday walk of life, um, me right now trying to go through a Sunday school lesson, we can't just um, sugarcoat something, <laughs> not for myself or, or anyone else. And uh, you don't want to be just uh, rude and obnoxious, but uh, approach people the right way and not just use God's word as a club, as one, one minister said. Uh, that's not the right way to do it, but how you approach people uh, makes a lot of difference. As my son was talking about in the Sunday school lesson, you know, how would you approach somebody is going to make a big difference in uh, whether they accept what you're telling them or not. And that is so true. And uh, as Paul uh, addressed these Romans, he addressed the problem with the, the Jewish community, and we'll, we'll look at that and what effect it has um on the, uh, the Christian, the way that the Christian would live out their life also. And, you know, we're saved by grace. We don't take nothing away from grace, totally by grace. Um, but we, we want to be good ambassadors for Christ also. But uh, even though Paul um, was, was pretty to the point with these people um, when he explained this problem to them, uh, we read in the book of Acts how when Paul came to Rome, and uh, how he landed there in, in Italy and uh, how the people came out to see him. They just didn't wait for him to get to the city. They came out to meet Paul. And uh, so that, that told you that they were receptive to, uh, at least some of them were receptive to the truth. I'm sure there's always going to be some that maybe don't want to listen to the truth. But, you know, when um, when we find out we're wrong about something, it it's, takes a bigger person like, well, Paul was a big person to admit that he uh, was doing wrong in persecuting the Christians. And he did a complete 180 and uh, started going the right way. So uh, he was a big enough man to <clears throat> to admit his, his wrong and, and get things going the right way. <clears throat> and we should be too. And uh, in this lesson, we, we see how Paul... Uh, <clears throat> how he explains this problem. I want to look at what an impact this problem can have on us in our, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, our uh, modern everyday life as, as a Christian. Romans uh, chapter 2 verse 1 says, Therefore, in other words, looking back at what he's already said, <clears throat> and he outlined a bunch of uh, sins in chapter 1. I won't try to hash through all those, but uh, there's quite a quite a list of them here. Things are going wrong at uh, in uh, in their community, and uh, you know we you know the idolatry we we looked at that and all the vices that go with that, and uh, <clears throat> other sins also he uh, he outlined here, um, and he <clears throat> I'm sorry, just can't get my throat cleared. Um, he he outlines these these sins and they were a problem in the community, and we have. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of the same problems today. So we're not rid of the problems. And Paul says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. 
So they're not practicing what they're preaching. And we want to look at uh, what Christ had to say about that. Got this marked here. <clears throat> Can get to it. Um, Christ says in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 5, says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you met, it shall be measured to you again. And, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull down the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. <clears throat> so Christ is saying if you're going to judge someone and you're going to hold someone to a standard then you're going to be held to that same standard you're going to be judged by the standards that you judge somebody else by um, uh, let's look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 verses 5 through 7 uh, this is a, a familiar story uh, <clears throat> how the uh, the Old Testament about King David and when he got in trouble. <clears throat> and uh, not to go through the, the whole story, I won't read the whole story, but um, if you recall, this is when Nathan the prophet came to him. And he Nathan told him this little uh, hypothetical story. I, I'm pretty sure it's not a a true uh, happening but it's just an illustration I think that Nathan used and uh, he told about a man a poor guy who had a, a little lamb and a rich guy came and took that lamb from him and it was the only one he had and uh, David is furious over this and uh, he is David is passing judgment on this guy here's an illustration out of the Old Testament how that someone can uh, can judge someone else, but yet they're the, also guilty themselves. Uh, verses 5 through 7 out of the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel. Kind of jumping in the middle of the story, but uh, I think everyone was pretty well familiar with this. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing. And because he had no pity. Then Nathan says to David here in verse 7. And Nathan said to David. Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed thee king over Israel. And I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And he goes on with the story. And uh, we'll, we'll get back to this a little later on. But uh, for now. Um, I just wanted to illustrate how that. Uh, a story out of the Old Testament how someone was judging the other person and a guy as great as David, a man after God's own heart, and he got off on the wrong foot. And uh, he was ready to judge this this, Ill, this man in the illustration that Nathan gave him and uh, condemn this man, but David was actually the man who was guilty himself. And Nathan was a, um, <clears throat> a brave man to come to David and, and tell him this because David powerful man he could have uh, commanded that Nathan be slain uh, just like Uriah was but um, you know and Nathan would have you know just being the individual he wouldn't have had any way to defend himself against this powerful king other than uh, you know if God would have stepped in and prevented it but David confessed his sin and uh, that's the reason David was a man after God's own heart he was a man who wasn't uh, too big of a man to humble himself and before God and admit that he did wrong. <clears throat> uh, now let's look at verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, man may uh, have unrighteous judgment or judgment is swayed, um, but God's judgment is going to be true. And these people who are judging others but uh, are doing the same things god will take care of them god's going to judge them uh, abraham 
he he wanted uh, as he pled as he was pleading for Sodom. Abraham was asking God for uh, God to spare the righteous. And God passed judgment on Sodom. Uh, look at verse um, 23 and 25 out of the 18th chapter of Genesis. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And, uh, you know, as you read this, you kind of think, well, you know, I, I just really don't think I'd approach God that way. But Abraham did, and uh, he may not have meant the way it sounded. I don't know. But it just almost sounds like, you know, he, you know God, are you going to do the right thing? I mean, that's kind of the, the way it sounds when you read this here. But Abraham may not have meant it that way in the day that he said this. Uh, verse 24 says, Perventure there be 50 righteous within the city, wilt thou also destroy and and not spare the place for fifty righteous, for the fifty righteous that are therein, be it far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You know, is he is he questioning whether God's going to do right here or not? I mean, he's pleading for Sodom, but. It almost sounds like he's uh, thinking that God's not going to do the right thing. It's kind of the way it sounds. But he may, like I say, he may not have meant it that way in the day. Uh, but he's asking for God to do righteous judgment, in which God does. And uh, I want to look at uh, Psalm 96, I think verse 10 through 13. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world shall also be established that it <clears throat> shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with truth. And that's what we need, isn't it? Uh, when Christ reigns in Jerusalem, we'll have a, a righteous leader. And, uh, you know, around the world we see a lot of injustice and uh, just the wrong thing being done. But when Christ is reigning, we know the right thing will be done. There will be righteous judgment. And uh, these these people here that Paul's talking about, are, they're doing wicked things, but they're, they're judging the other guy and but doing the same things the other guy, uh, they're living in the, the same sins that they're judging other people for. Uh, so Christ has said, "Judge not that you be not judged." Uh, so should we judge? Uh, Paul says, and uh, I won't read this, but Paul says in First Corinthians six uh, one through seven, he gets, he talks about how the Christians should be able to judge among themselves. There should be uh, someone there the can handle uh, judging between two Christians instead of them going to law, going outside the church to to get to settle their differences. They should they say you should be able to handle this inside the church and without having to go to a lawyer. Um, so to judge or not judge, what what are we talking about here? Uh, <clears throat> Aaron kind of explained it really good. I think he, the way he put it, uh, Christ was talking about the spirit of judgment. It's um, are you being self-righteous in your judgment? Uh, that's what he's talking about. And Christ is warning us that you know when we judge somebody, we're going to be held to that same that same standard. But if we're just being someone self-righteous and uh, coming to someone and judging someone else, and we're, when we're guilty like these guys that Paul's talking about of the same thing ourselves or worse, um, uh, that's that is not the right spirit of judgment. Uh, you know, we're to restore such a one. If someone <clears throat> messes up, we're to restore them in the spirit of meekness, what the Bible t tells us, lest we be tempted ourselves. you know. We may not pass the test ourselves if, <laughs> if we, we don't know to wear in the other guy's shoes. So always it's restoring the one who's who's in the wrong is, is the idea. <clears throat> and uh, 
And I think Aaron was correct in saying this, this, the spirit of the judgment is what Christ is talking about. Should we judge? Well, Paul is saying, you know, that there's time when you have to settle differences. And uh, the Christians, you should be spiritually minded enough to, to be able to settle these differences. Uh, as Tim talked about, the, the natural man, uh, he doesn't spiritually discern God's word. But we in the church, Christians should know enough about God's word and how things should be handled to be able to, <clears throat> to settle differences. Um, for instance, if, if I was uh, overtaken in something... Um, one of the big problems we have nowadays is the drug problem. So um, if I would get hooked on drugs and I'm out here dealing in drugs and should the church judge judge me on that, call me in my hand on that? Well, certainly, you know, you have to, to judge in, in a situation like that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but we, we need to be cautious and, and take Christ's warning, you know, that, you know, how you judge someone, and that's how you're going to be judged. Um, we don't want to shoot or wound it, as the old uh, cliche goes. Um, they say Christians are bad to shoot or wounded. We, we don't want to do that. We want to restore someone in the spirit of meekness. But James, in, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, I don't know if I wrote this down uh, word for word the way it was. I think I did, but... Uh, he talks about this. He says, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So if I'm going to go out here, and, it's like I am right now, I'm teaching a Sunday school lesson. And I did a Sunday uh, afternoon service. That's when we have our Sunday school and an and, and, and afternoon service now. Things are a little different than when I was a kid. But anyway, uh, James is warning us about practicing what we preach. If I'm going to teach someone something and I will say this is what's right this is what's wrong this is what the word of God says how you should live what you know you should do this you shouldn't do that I realize that uh, if I'm not doing that I'm going to receive the greater condemnation because I'm I'm out here being a hypocrite about it so James gives that warning uh, let's look at um, <clears throat> verses 3 through 7 these people who are doing these things do they think they can get by with it they think God's going to overlook it Maybe because they're a Jew, they think their heritage is going to take care of their uh, wrongdoing. Uh, it says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You know, they think they're going to get by with it. <clears throat> or despisest thou the riches of his goodness? And forbearance, you know, the, the tolerance that God has for for you doing wrong and he's putting up with it and the long suffering, the the endurance that he has in putting up with the, the wrongdoing, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So God's God's intentions, you know, sometimes we'll see people doing something wrong and you you know, you think God's judgment's gonna fall right away, but God's goodness and his forbearance his tolerance and his long suffering is trying to lead them back to him that's what god is doing but after the heart after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of god so that that judgment is coming uh, <clears throat> and they are they're building up this wrath of God upon themselves and their, and their revelation of God's judgment that's going to come if they, if the hardness of the heart continues and you know they despise the fact that God is, is putting up with them and God is enduring with them. God's aim is to bring them back to Him. <clears throat> but if they don't, they're, the result is going to be wrath as we read in verse 5. Um, uh, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of righteous judgment of God. <clears throat> and we won't be able to say then this, that we got cheated because God's judgment is going to be righteous. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now if we just stop right here, let's look at... Uh, uh, I want to read, read verse 6 and 7 here. I'm sorry I didn't read those. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now notice that. Render to him according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing 
seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. So if we just stop reading right there in Romans and don't read the rest of the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, we might conclude that uh, salvation comes through going to good deeds, doing good deeds and, uh, and not doing the wrong things. We might think it's by works. Uh, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So does God give us eternal life, salvation, by going doing good deeds and not doing the wrong thing? Well, if we... Paul's leading up to a point here, and let's, I'm going to flip over to Romans 3 and verse 28 and read it. He's working up to this point. So he says in, in the third chapter, verse 20, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So he's leading up to this. We have to realize that <clears throat> you have to take the scripture as a whole. You know, we, if we just stop reading right there, and this, this is a whole letter to the Romans, so you need to read it and get the whole context of what he's, he's telling us. So uh, if we just take little bits and pieces, we might get confused and, and get the wrong interpretation. Paul is not teaching here that salvation comes by works. Uh, and that is, that is plain. We, re we realize that fully. Uh, <clears throat> get the right page here. Uh, I'm going to jump down to verse 11. I'm trying to make this as long as I did the last one. The last one was probably a little longer than what I should have done. But, uh, <clears throat> verse 11 through 13. For there is no respect to persons with God. Now he's talking to about Jews and Gentiles. The Jews had the law given to them. The Gentiles didn't. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law, you know, the Gentiles, shall also perish without the law and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law so if you're saying if you're a, a jew and you're saying well i'm going to keep the law or if you're a gentile and you say well i'm going to keep the law you're going to be judged by that law or are you going to be able to please god by keeping the law and god's going to save your soul uh, that's what you're saying i'm depending on my ability to keep the law for salvation and you know that's not going to work for here's the reason verse 13 for not the hearers of the law are just before god but the doers of the law shall be justified <clears throat> so let's think back before the law the very first murder Cain, who slew abel do you think that he knew better than to kill his brother i think all of us will uh, agree that he did he knew better than to do that we're going to look at look why in just a minute uh, the people of Noah's day, uh, when the flood came, you know, a priest, uh, an angel talked about this church, how he preached for 120 years. Um, and uh, the only ones who were saved was his own family from that flood. And, uh, you know, it's a long time to preach. And uh, these people rejected his preaching. And, you know, we, we talked about how that was probably a little bit discouraging to Noah, but I'm sure he was glad he was one of them that was on the ark when the rain started coming. But... Those, all those people who perished and didn't listen to the, the preaching of Noah, do you think they knew better than to live the way they were doing? They were evil people back then. And that's why judgment came. Do um, <clears throat> you think they knew better? Well, I think they did. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's look at verses 14 to 16 and get a little better understanding of this. But when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature... And those do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not a law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. And Tim mentioned, you know, how God gives uh, a man a conscience, and he deals to every man a measure of faith. So, and I hadn't really thought about that to mention it, but we have those things. We have those two things, a conscience and a measure of faith to understand. Uh, verse 15 again, which show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts. But meanwhile, excusing or 
accusing or excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the secrets of man are going to come out. <laughs> we're, not going to, we're not going to hide anything. We might hide something from one another down here, but we're not going to hide it from God. The secrets of man will be judged. Um, let's look at, back at Romans chapter 1, verses 19. Uh, well, I'll start reading 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So God has revealed himself to man. And uh, we have that, that conscience. We have that measure of faith. And there's something within a man that God places in there that he knows right from wrong. Uh, now, I know that a law was given to the Jews, and it, the, the law was given to reveal to man. He has this written law now, and he, it's written down. You know, you like to have something written when you have a contract or something that's written down so you can go back to it and look. Well, God give mankind the law, the Jewish people, uh, to show them that they could not be righteous on their own. That was the whole point of it. So when did man become accountable um, for sin? If we think back to the Garden of Eden, you know, man, uh, when he was first created, man and woman, um, they were naked and they weren't ashamed. And, you know, God gave them a choice. They had a... a the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil and they were told not to eat of that the tree of knowledge of good and evil um, but when they did that's when their accountability with sin became the yeah, man wanted to be somebody and Satan tempted Eve that you know told her you know you'll be like God you know and he tried to let on like God was withholding something from her that was good but God was protecting them but he had to give them a choice between good and evil um, in order to have a relationship with a man. You know, man's not, God didn't create us to be just like a robot. You know, people are all up in the air about AI. Oh, AI can do this and that and you can think. And, well, it, it only does what it's programmed to do. Someone is behind it programming it. And when it starts doing evil things, you, you realize it's not AI, but it's the evil guy behind AI. Uh, as I say, I think uh, it, it, that may be how the image of the beast talks, but uh, I think it's Revelation 13, if I remember right. But anyway, you can check me on that one. I might get, get mixed up. But um, Man is not just a robot. He was created with a choice uh, to, between choose between good and evil. And uh, Eve, of course, chose to eat the fruit, to try to be somebody, and Adam. Um, you know, I think Adam probably knew better. He just didn't do better. But uh, both of them, <clears throat> both of them brought upon mankind the the knowledge of good and evil. Right then and there, they had the knowledge. They knew they were naked then, and and tried to clothe themselves. So they knew then what sin was. And um, mankind can't say that he doesn't know. You know, you ever see these? Uh, sometimes someone will do some uh, terrible crime. Someone will say. Uh, Oh, well, they just didn't know better. Well, why did they hide? You know, generally when I do something wrong, I hide, don't you? Um, if you're going to break speed limit, you try to watch out for the highway state patrol, don't you? Uh, you better when you come through Hanging Rock, where I live, you, the uh, Hanging Rock police will get you. <laughs> uh, see, Jim, my friend here, Jim Nance, watching, appreciate Jim. You know all about the Hanging Rock police, I'm sure. You, uh, When you're uh, out uh, conducting your business, um, your business, Joan, and uh, I'm sure you've come up through here and you've had to watch yourself. Hopefully you haven't got caught. Uh, but, you know, if uh, if they catch me and I'm guilty, I mean, that's my fault. You know, I'm, I've done something wrong, haven't I? Well, for all these things we do wrong, we still answer to God. The Hang Rock Police may not get me every time, but, you know, God knows. So man knows better. Uh, we hide if we do something wrong. We're going to hide it somewhat. Um, <clears throat> and um, 
So if they know better, why didn't they do better? Well, man, man loves darkness rather than light. Uh, and Satan is a huge deceiver, as my son says different times. Uh, when he picks up someone on the ambulance and they've been a, a drug abuser or, or something else of that nature, some kind of substance abuse, he said, you know, these people don't start out uh, thinking they're going to end up like they are and uh, just their life destroyed with drugs. That's not how they think it's going to end. Uh, and Satan convinces them that this is going to be a good thing. It's going to be a fun thing, or maybe a kid takes something to get to a college class or a test or something so they can perk herself up or whatever, and uh, thinking that, hey, you know, I won't get hooked. And then the next thing you know, something bad happens. We all know somebody that uh, drugs has led to a, a bad end or alcohol or something like that. Um, Satan is a big deceiver. And uh, one of the things you don't want to be deceived in, you know, you know, we read about David here, and we're going to look back at him in just a few minutes, but um, David, a man after God's own heart, uh, got overtaken with temptation. Uh, the main thing uh, you want to be careful about is don't be deceived in thinking you can't be deceived because you, you'll let your guard down. Um, <clears throat> Let's look at uh, verses 17 through 21. Uh, Behold, thou art a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast to God. You know, the Jew was proud of their heritage, and God had given, the, given them the law. And knowest his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed, instructed out of the law and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. They think they're instructing everyone else. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? So, <clears throat> the, these people were, were instructors. They thought they were teaching the other guy, but they hadn't taught themselves. They hadn't learned themselves to, to do the right thing. And, and Christ tells a little parable. Um, in Luke, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, he tells the parable about a publican, you know, a tax collector, a, a guy that they really, customarily they didn't like him very well because they worked for the Roman government and sometimes they were Jews working for the Roman, Roman government. And uh, they were noted for, for not being honest. And this Pharisee, he's one of the elite in the, the Jewish religion, uh, supposedly uh, a person who is expert in the law and is following the law right as closely as you possibly can so christ tells this little parable he says and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others two, two men went up into the temple to pray the one a pharisee and the other a publican the pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted that's the parable christ told about the pharisee who thought he was something and as paul outlines these these people here they think they're something they're teaching the other guy but they themselves uh, are in need of practicing what they preach um, so if we don't practice what we preach you know, um, and we believe in grace, that grace covers sin, 
So what difference does it make if grace is going to cover the sin? Well, you know, if, if a person has the, the attitude that uh, a uh, grace is going to cover everything, I'm just going to do everything I want. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us there's pleasure in sin for a season. Well, I'm going to enjoy this pleasure, and grace is going to cover it. I'll just repent. I'll just ask God for forgiveness, and His grace will cover this. Now, if we got that attitude, uh, I'm no one's judge, but we need to check ourselves to make sure we've truly had a relationship with Christ because um, the Bible tells us that we are a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away, all, all things become new. And we, we enter into a fight against sin, to fighting against temptation, trying to bring ourselves in uh, subjection to God's will, living by God's word. And uh, if we don't have any any love for God's word and we don't have any, any respect for God to obey his word, have, do we really have a relationship with him? That's, that's something a person needs to ask himself. I can't answer that for another person, but um, Walter Priest always had this little saying, he says, no change, no Jesus. And uh, a person needs to check themselves. Have you truly accepted Christ? Because when you get a hold of grace... And you realize that you are saved purely because Christ shed his blood on Calvary for you. And that purchased your salvation. He suffered your hell for you. And his death, burial, and resurrection is what saves you. And you don't deserve any of that, and it's given to you freely. Then it, it puts in a, a desire in your heart to, to live the right way, to, to not displease God. You know, I... Um, uh, it, I always felt like it'd be shameful for me to to, um, to disappoint my parents. I'm not saying I didn't. I, I know I did, but um, oh, <clears throat> I used to be a liar, <laughs> right here. Uh, but you know, it. I didn't want to disappoint mom and dad, and the same way with God. You don't want to disappoint God as a child of God, uh, as a Christian. And uh, what? But what difference does it make? What? if grace is going to cover it. There's, there's a lot of difference. Uh, let's look at um, verses 23 through 25 now. Uh, let's see, that's right thing. Um, yeah, 23 through 25. Um, <clears throat> I think I should have read verse 21 there a while ago, but I forgot. Uh, thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, it profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision, circumcision is made uncircumcision. So let's look back now at that story of David. Um, Paul hits the nail on the head here. It says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? He asked that question. It says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. So let's look back at that story of David. Back in Second Samuel chapter 12. We'll look at verse what do we want to do here? Verses 9 through 14. <clears throat> Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah. And Nathan speaking to David here. He says, Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy, to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword for the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. So Nathan is telling uh, David what God has pronounced, what God has said. Because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will 
take thy wives before thine eyes, and will give them unto thy neighbor. And you remember what Absalom done with, with David's wives? Uh, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of, of this son. You know, Absalom's son uh, can be distorted about what he did with David's wives. For thou didst this secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and, be, and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. So David received grace, but there's a consequence for what he did. God's hand of protection is, is all for David. He's going, his house is going to, he's going to suffer because the violence is going to be uh, in his house. <clears throat> I'll raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. God's protection is, is not going to be upon David like it once was. Howbeit, because by this deed, now listen to this, Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born of thee shall surely die. Uh, <clears throat> you can read that story. Now, I want to caution this. You know, a lot of bad things happen in life. You know, we may look at a, a country around the world and say, well, you know, that earthquake hit there because uh, they were idol worshippers. Um, and we might get sick ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm sick because I've I done something bad. Uh, or that person over there got sick because they done something bad. Or this person died because they done something bad. Well, sometimes the judgment of God is in those things as we read right here with David. But we got to be careful not to to just think that about every time something bad happens. Because we live in a sin-cursed world that, you know, bad things are happening all the time. Uh, each and every one of us, um, we're going to die. We're not going to get out of this world alive. So, I think if it is God's judgment, we will know. Uh, but don't, you know, we don't want to go pointing the finger and saying every bad thing that happened, that's the judgment of God upon us. It just may be life because uh, none of us are immune from bad things in this life. It's We live in this world that until Christ comes back and uh, reigns and uh, we, we go out into eternity, we, you know, we're, we're just in this evil world. Um, we have to put up with it. But so, but sometimes the judgment of God is that, and He, He says here why. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born of thee shall surely die. So David has given occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. You know, as a Christian. When we get out of line and we we get into sin, we get into things that are not right, and our co-workers, our friends, our family, or the everyday person sees that, that maybe someone that we don't know that's watching our life and they see that, uh, we, we bring down the name of Christ. We, uh, we tear down our witness before the unsaved. They look at that and they think, hey, you know, why do I want to be a Christian? I'm just as good as that guy right there. Look what he's doing. If that's all right, then I'm all right. You know, we we give occasion for people to blaspheme God when we as a born-again believer uh, don't live the way we should. We get into something we shouldn't. I'm not saying that any of us are perfect as Christians, but we need, we need to be careful about how we live out our life and how we witness. Now, uh, I want to read to you out of Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 17 through 27. And look what God did uh, with the children of Israel. You know, God chose Israel to be the nation to whom he would bring the Savior, Jesus Christ, God's Son. And he's going to bless the world through that, through that nation. And uh, that nation is to be a witness to the rest of the world. Uh, but, you know, they, they slipped out into idolatry. They got in all kind of messes. They got carried off to Babylon. The Roman Empire was over them at one time. Uh, Persia, you know, after the Babylon, Persia, and the Roman Empire then. Um, look what God is doing as he's dealing with the nation of Israel. And this is God's, this is God's desire. Uh, verses 17 through 27. <clears throat> out of the uh, 36th chapter of Ezekiel. 
son of man when the house of israel dwelt in their own land they defiled it by their own way and by their doings their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman therefore i poured out my fury upon it for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it and remember we talked about israel how they got into the uh, offering their children to idols to molech and i scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through the countries according to their the way according to their doings i judged them and when they entered unto the heathen where they went they profaned my holy name when they said to them these are the people of the lord and are gone forth out of his land but i had pity for my holy name now notice here what god said but i had pity for mine holy name which the house of israel had profaned among the heathen where they went therefore say unto the house of israel thus saith the lord god i do not this for your sakes o house of israel but for mine holy name's sake which ye have profaned among the heathen whether ye went and i will sanctify my great name which is which was profaned among profaned among the heathen which ye have profaned in the midst of them and the heathen shall know that i am the lord saith the lord god when i shall be sanctified in you before their eyes now notice what god has done he's done this for his name well did god need to prove something to somebody did he need to to show who he was um you know god is god he doesn't need to prove anything to himself but what he's doing here he's revealing himself to the heathen notice what he says here in verse 23 and i will sanctify my great name which was profaned among the heathen now god knows who he is but he's proving who he is to the heathen by, by his workings with israel which ye have profaned in the midst of them and the heathen shall know that i am the lord which lord saith the lord god when i shall be sanctified in you before their eyes and that's a little bit of reading but there, there's some points i want to make here for i will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and i and will bring you into your own land then will i sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols i will cleanse you and from from all your idols will i cleanse you a new heart also will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you and i will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and i will give you a heart of flesh and i will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them now he's he's going to uh, be a witness to the heathen by his dealings with israel now i want to bring out uh, another couple of verses we look back here at verse 23 where he says and the heathen shall know that i am the lord saith the lord god uh, and in verse 36 he says then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that i the lord build the ruined places and plant that which was desolate i the lord have spoken it and i will do it now in verse 38 again in the same chapter he says as the holy flock as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with the flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. God is being a witness to the world through, through the uh, Jewish people. Uh, they've become a nation again, and uh, that's just something that's uh, astounding. Uh, people wouldn't have thought that could have, could have ever happened, um, but it did. And uh, in this ancient time, uh, <clears throat> God is prophesying what he's going to do through these Jewish people. And he, and the heathen will know. God is revealing himself to the heathen. He's uh, the God of the Jews. He's the God of the Gentiles. That's his intentions in working with Abraham and bringing about that Jewish nation. It's not that he's 
uh, having uh, favorites, but he had to choose someone. And, you know, God is sovereign. He can choose whoever he wants. And he chose these, these people. He chose Abraham. Go back to the 12th chapter of Genesis and chose Abraham to, to be the man through who this nation would be brought into existence and uh, Abraham's descendants. And here we are today. They're still around. And God's not done with them. And the uh, Savior was born through this group of people. Um, salvation is brought to all man. You know, the whole world is blessed through the workings of God, through uh, Abraham, through this nation, and through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> that's what God is doing right here. And as we... Uh, this lesson was supposed to went into chapter 3, but it, it was just a little too long. We didn't make it in Sunday school either to that. But um, in Second Peter 3, 9, uh, God said he's not willing that any should perish. And that's his aim here. But it, it takes something different than just keeping a set of rules like uh, the Jewish people thought. And their heritage, you know, you, you, sometimes you talk to people and they'll say, well... Uh, they, they want to get out of the conversation. You you talk to them about God, about church, and try to lead up to salvation. And uh, they'll say um, something like, well, you know, someone in their family is was associated with church. Uh, uh, you know, their grandpa or, or somebody, an aunt and uncle, uh, brother or sister, mom and dad or whatever. They, you know, their great-great-grandpappy baptized Daniel Boone or something. You know, it's hard hard telling what you'll hear but uh, they try to look back at somebody that was uh, associated with church maybe it was a Christian maybe it was a preacher whatever uh, but you know your heritage like that didn't affect you it's Christ said you know who do you say that I am you know who does men say that I am but who do you say that I am that's the important thing who do you say Christ is uh, Christ, uh, Paul writes here in verse 28 and 29 we'll close out here for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Now, God gave them the, the right of circumcision for uh, an outward appearance of what was inward in their heart. And uh, he says here in verse 29, But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. whose praise is not of men, but of God. So God is looking at what's in your heart, uh, just like baptism. It's uh, it's just a symbol of what you've accepted in your heart that you you were buried with Christ and raised again, and uh, you've accepted what Christ has done for your salvation, and not what you can do. It's not this keeping of a, a set of rules. Do we keep rules as Christians? Well, I hope so. <laughs> if you're one, I hope you do. Um, but, you know, you might have a different set of rules than I do, but God is looking at what's in the heart. It's uh, not, as he's saying here, it's not the, the physical circumcision, it's what's in your heart. You know, they may have went through the rite of circumcision as a Jew, but that didn't mean their heart was right with God. Um, I think it was Adrian Rogers said something like, um, he had a lot of funny sayings. It's something like you can be baptized so many times that the tadpoles got your social security number, but that don't save you. And he had a lot of little funny things like that. He's he's a great preacher, I thought. But uh, appreciate Tanya watching, and I don't know who else is there? I know see Jim watching. Appreciate all you that uh, the watch these. And uh, if there's anyone out there that doesn't know the Christ your Savior, I uh, I uh, urge you to to get that right with God. Uh, and uh, if you want to hear a good sermon on salvation, um, I know Tanya will be posting Aaron's sermon from today. It's a great sermon. And I'll say, I'm not saying that just because it's my son, but it, it, it's truly a great sermon. And I think, think you could benefit from it. And whether you're saved or unsaved, but definitely if you're unsaved, you need to hear that sermon. And if you accept Christ as your Savior, let us know to church. Be glad to hear that. Uh, like I say, appreciate everyone for watching these. Uh, and you guys have a good evening.